Hello and welcome to our program this evening. My name is Thorin Tritter. I am the Museum and Programming Director at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center of Nassau County, which is located in Glen Cove, New York. Tonight is one of the nights on our annual calendar that draws particular attention. Jewish communities and Holocaust memorials around the world arrange programming to mark the horrific events that took place on November 9th and 10th of 1938, 83 years ago, when a state-sponsored attack against Jewish businesses, homes, and synagogues rolled across Germany, Austria, and Nazi-occupied areas of Czechoslovakia. Known as Kristallnacht, it involved far more than just the breaking of glass. Synagogues were burned, stores and homes were looted, and 30,000 Jewish men were arrested and detained in concentration camps. And to make it all the more humiliating and painful, millions of German citizens either actively participated in the attacks or stood silently by to watch as the events unfolded. That tacit acceptance by large swaths of the German public as the violence was being committed gave Hitler and the Nazis the green light to go forward with even more radical plans to harm Jews and was a crucial step on the path towards the Holocaust. To commemorate Kristallnacht, HMTC is both holding this program this evening, but it's also joining with partners around the world as part of the Let There Be Light initiative. We have our building lit up, as you can see in the photo on this screen. Um, as part of a global protest to draw attention to the rising number of anti-Semitic incidents and hate crimes that we are witnessing, and as a symbol of our combined struggle to combat racism and intolerance. We also, however, are holding this evening's program. Before I talk about that, let me share some reminders about other programs that we have coming up. Oops, there we go. Uh, in addition to remembering Kristalna, we also mark Veterans Day this week, which will be held on Thursday on the anniversary of the end of World War I. In honor of Veterans Day, I'll be focusing tomorrow's Curator's Corner program on a photo in our museum of an American GI from Long Island, Herman High Horowitz, who fought his way across Europe and then helped to liberate the camps at Ordruf and Bergen-Belsen. Then on Sunday, we are hosting our next program in the Sunday with Survivor series. In this case with Holocaust survivor Anita Weisbord, who'll speak about her childhood in Vienna, her memories of Kristalna, her experiences on the kinder transport and her life after the war. I hope you'll join us to hear her testimony and for the Q and A that will follow. And one more program to mention next Tuesday, as part of our David Taub Real Upstander film series, we will be showing a PBS documentary entitled America and the Holocaust, Deceit and Indifference, that explores the bureaucratic hurdles put up by the US State Department to make it harder for Jewish refugees to get out of Germany even after Kristallnacht. And we will be joined by Christopher Boyan from the office of the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, the UN Refugee Agency that was established in the wake of the Holocaust, who will help us connect this history with contemporary refugee issues. You can find details about these programs and a full list of our upcoming programs on our website at www.hmtcli.org under the events tab. And I also hope you'll click on the give now button if you go to our website and help support our virtual programs. Okay, let's get to tonight's program. All too often, when we talk about the events of Kristallnacht or the larger history of the Holocaust, we forget about the countless heroic acts of resistance undertaken by the Jews of Europe. Tonight, as part of our remembrance of Kristallnacht, we wanna draw our collective attention to the way Jews fought back against Nazi oppression. And for that, we are honored to have with us our guest this evening, Jeffrey Sussman, who will be uh, talking about his new book, called Holocaust Fighters, Boxers, Resisters, and Avengers. Um, his book, as the title suggests, captures the image of resistance that we wanna emphasize for our Kristallnacht program. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. Jeffrey Sussman is a prolific writer who's published 15 nonfiction books, including 
almost one a year for the past five years. A number of his books are about boxing, including his last book, Boxing and the Mob, which came out last year, and other books about Rocky Graziano, Max Baer, and Barney Ross, to name a few. But in Holocaust Fighters, in his newest book, he combines his interest and considerable knowledge about boxing with the larger history of the Holocaust, telling the story of five boxers, four of whom were Jews and one of whom was a member of the Roma and Sinti, who were persecuted by the Nazis and then who fought back. He also uses these five boxers as a lead-in to raise other examples of Jewish resistance, most notably the Avengers, a paramilitary unit that hunted down Nazi perpetrators after the war. But rather than hear from me about these stories of resistance, let's hear from the author himself. One more comment before I pass the virtual stage over to you, Jeffrey, and that is to everybody out there, if you have questions for Jeffrey, please use the Q&A window of Zoom, type them in, and we'll make sure to get to them at the end of Jeffrey Sussman's presentation. Okay, so with that words, those words of introduction and a little layout of our plan, I'm delighted to welcome Jeffrey Sussman to our virtual stage. Thanks so much for being here, Jeffrey. It's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. It's, uh, it's really an honor to be here. Um, a, a lot of people had asked me uh, how I got interested in this subject, and, and, and as Thorin mentioned, I have uh, written a number of books about boxing, and I had written a book about uh, 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 the predominance of Jewish boxers in America from 1910 to 1941, when they were the uh, uh, when they predominated in, in in boxing. There were over 200 Jewish boxers, and uh, 24 of them held world champions. In, in, in the process of my doing a, a research about boxers, I came across the story of a man named Harry Haft, who, had, uh, who was a boxer who had been confined to Auschwitz, where he was forced to box and had uh, 76 fights and, and won all of them. And however, uh, I'd like to begin by talking about uh, a boxer named Victor Young Perez. He was a, uh, a Jew from Tunis, and he had uh, he and his uh, older brother, who was known as Kid Perez, uh, trained his boxers at a uh, Maccabee club in uh, Tunis. Uh, and part of the reason for their training there was to overcome uh, and be able to defend themselves against uh, anti-Semites. And, and the Maccabee clubs were uh, very uh, pro-Zionist at the time before there was an existence of Israel. And uh, Jews were taught how to box and how to defend themselves when necessary. He uh, uh, proved to be an extremely proficient boxer and uh, realized that the future for him lay in Paris, not in Tunis. And he moved to Paris and had a number of boxing matches and became the youngest flyweight boxing champion of, of, of Europe. I believe he was only about 20 years old uh, at the time. And though he was a small man, only uh, five feet one, which explains why he was a, a flyweight boxing champion, um, he, was, he was very handsome and, and very charismatic and had uh, uh, affairs with a number of uh, famous French movie stars. Uh, uh, one of them was considered uh, the leading French movie star of the 1930s. Her name was Mireille uh, uh, Ballin, and uh, they became the talk of the town. Uh, wherever they went, they were photographed in nightclubs, in, in restaurants, uh, on shopping sprees on the Champs Elysees. Uh, and there wasn't a week that went by when their photographs weren't in magazines and, and newspapers. However, after the uh, Nazis conquered France, uh, Mireille Ballin, being an actress who was also an opportunist, and was always looking out for uh, the best opportunities for herself, realized that she'd be better off uh, with the Nazis rather than with a Tunisian Jew. And uh, she wound up betraying uh, Perez to her uh, Nazi lover, uh, a man named Burl Despach, uh, which sounds a little like despot. And um, uh, Perez's older brother had urged him to come back to Tunis where he felt that he would be uh, protected. However, uh, Perez was so taken uh, by his own celebrity 
that he felt that uh, being so uh, famous, he would be protected, that, that he would not have to endure uh, the injustices that were being inflicted on Jews all over Europe. It, it, it was a terrible mistake and, and, and it, it changed his whole life because after Balin uh, betrayed him to the Nazis, he was arrested and he was taken to Auschwitz and he was put to work in an Auschwitz subcamp called Monowitz, which was run by the IG Farben Chemical Company. And he was uh, uh, forced to do really backbreaking work there. However, eventually they realized that he was a boxer. And uh, the, uh, the Nazis who guarded the camp, the SS, wanted him to fight other people so that uh, for, the, for their entertainment. And, and they, uh, because he was a Jew, they expected him to lose and be uh, beaten very badly. So they, 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 uh, they put him up against a, uh, uh, an SS fighter who was probably twice uh, the size of, of Perez. And Perez was getting roundly beaten. I mean, he, he was a bloody mess. However, the Jews in the camp were invited to come and watch this spectacle. And they were told also that they couldn't raise their heads. If they raised their heads, they would be dragged off to the gas chambers. So they kept their heads down, but they were also able to see what was going on. And they knew that uh, uh, Perez was known in the ring as young because he, he was so young. And all of a sudden, a whisper, a chorus of whispers went up and you could hear people going, yeah, 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 yeah. And it got to him and he became inspired by it. And he called upon all his old boxing skills and he was able to defeat uh, this SS fighter and, 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 and win. Well, th th this was really too much for the SS guards. They were disgusted at this and th they put him uh, to work fighting uh, as often as twice a week. And they told him that if he lost any of his fights that he would be dragged off and killed. So he had a, a very strong incentive to win those fights and he did win them. Now, you know, as the allies were closing in on the concentration camps, uh, the Nazis uh, decided to have what were called death marches where they were evacuating the camps uh, to remove evidence of the atrocities they had committed. And on a death march out of the uh, Monowitz uh, subcamp, uh, Perez spotted a stale loaf of bread off to the side of the road. And he went to grab the bread, to, not only to feed himself, but to feed a number of his starving uh, colleagues who were marching with him. And an SS guard saw him and ran up behind him with a rifle and shot him in the head twice and killed him. That was on uh, January 21st, 1945. And uh, Perez was only 33 years old. The next uh, uh, person I wrote about, who was a fascinating man, whose son I got to interview, was a boxer named Nathan Chapow who uh, was a terrific natural athlete. He grew up in uh, Riga, Latvia, and he was a football player, a soccer player, uh, a wrestler, a boxer. Uh, he, he had extraordinary athletic ability. And like Perez, he also trained to box at a Maccabee club in, 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 in Riga. And he was very upset, uh, as you can imagine, when the uh, Nazis came and, 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 and took over Riga, and he knew that they uh, intended to destroy the Jews. And, and he said to uh, one of his friends, and, 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 th and this became a motto for his life, he said, it was better to die a brave man than to be killed as a coward. And if he had to fight against the Nazis, he was going to fight against them. And there was an SS uh, uh, commander in Riga who had a particular dislike of Chapau. He disliked him because Chapau was strong, he was bold, he carried himself with a great deal of confidence and he refused to buckle under to the humiliations imposed by uh, the Nazis. And one day Hoffman followed him into, his, into uh, Schaphau's home and then pushed him against the, the wall the way let's say a policeman would uh, spread eagle someone against the wall with his hands and feet uh, apart and, and pushed up against the wall. Uh, Schaphau turned his head to look at uh, Hoffman and he saw that Hoffman was uh, withdrawing a Luger from his holster. And, and all of a sudden, Chapau realized that he was about to be shot. He quickly turned around and with an enormously hard punch, 
knocked out uh, Hoffman, who fell to the floor. He grabbed Hoffman's Luger and was about to shoot him, but then dis uh, realized that if he were to shoot him, the sound of the gun would uh, alert other SS men and they would come running and he would be arrested. So instead he grabbed a lamp that was in the room and he used it as a club and he clubbed uh, uh, Hoffman's head until there was no head left basically. I mean, he, he just shattered him and killed him. And he then uh, wrapped the body in a shroud and, dra and in the middle of the night dragged it to a dark alley and left it there. He had hoped that it would take several days at least for the SS to discover the body. But in fact, they found it the next morning and they then uh, assembled all the Jews into the town square. And they demanded that the perpetrator step forward and confess to the crime. No one stepped forward. So the SS commandant said that if uh, no one came forward, that he was going to hang two innocent Jews in the town square. This put a terrible burden on Schapau. If he stepped forward and confessed to killing uh, Hoffman, he would have been hanged. Uh, if he didn't step forward, two innocent Jews would be hanged. He obviously had a very strong survival instinct and two Jew, innocent Jews were taken into the center of town and they were hanged. Uh, Schapau felt terrible guilt about this, but he also realized there was nothing else he could have done. And at the, at the same time that this was going on, the Nazis rounded up 25,000 Jews from that area and they took them to the Rumbawa forest where all 25,000 Jews were machine gunned to death and, and, and left there. It was one of the worst massacres of Jews other than what happened at uh, Babi Yar, uh, which, which was another terrible slaughter of Jews. Chapa was arrested and along with uh, surviving Jews of Riga and taken to uh, a concentration camp called Kaiserwald. And uh, there he was also like uh, Perez forced to box for his life. He was told that if he didn't box, he would be killed. But he was also told that, or he didn't, was told he saw that uh, those who fought against him and lost, that, that uh, they were dragged off to the gas chambers or they weren't given enough food and they starved to death. They, um, because he, he was such a winning boxer, they felt that he needed to have a strong opponent that, that could uh, beat him. And uh, so a, uh, a high ranking Nazi official brought a uh, former um, middleweight boxing champion to the camp. The boxing champion, his name was uh, Werner Samuel. And uh, all the uh, uh, Nazi guards bet on Samuel to beat Schapau. It didn't work out that way. Schapau uh, uh, beat the crap out of, out of uh, Samuel uh, uh, and, and the, the Nazis and, 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 and the uh, high echelon officials from Berlin, they were stunned, they were angry, they were miserably unhappy about this. They felt embarrassed and humiliated. And after the fight, they dragged Samuel off and no one ever heard of him again. So one can only assume that they either shot him or that they gassed him for losing the fight to Schapau. From Kaiser World, uh, Schapau was transported to the Stutthof uh, concentration camp. And Stutthof, uh, the guards were very, very sadistic there. As the trains of Jews came into the camp, the guards would assemble like a, a chorus and they would sing a song that was really quite ugly here's what they would sing. Jews go through the Red Sea, the waves close in, and the world is happy. Jews are drowned. And uh, once again, Schapau was forced to, to fight to defend himself. And, um, but he was about to be shipped to a, another uh, a camp called uh, Magdeburg. And uh, the uh, commandant of that camp had come to uh, Stutthof and asked if there were any people who had been engineers before the war. Schapau figured that he could save himself by saying that he had been an engineer. So he told the commandant that he had been an engineer before the war and he was shipped off to this new camp. And, in, and, and instead of um, giving uh, given duties of an engineer, all he had to do was uh, sweep up uh, 
uh, a, a barracks that had nothing to do with being an engineer. But he and uh, several of his colleagues uh, managed to escape from the camp. Uh, they, they did so dressed as uh, SS guards. And uh, when, when they encountered, uh, when they were encountered by allied troops, uh, Shapow had to convince them that uh, he wasn't an, uh, an SS guard. And the American troop, he couldn't speak English and, and the American troops who found him uh, uh, couldn't speak Yiddish, which was his primary language. And so they found an American soldier who could speak Yiddish and, and he and Shapow were able to converse and Shapow was able to convince him that uh, he, he was in fact had been a prisoner and, 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 and was Jewish. Uh, after the war, uh, Shapow went to what was then uh, Mandate Palestine. And there he met a, uh, ran into a, a man who had been a con man back in Riga, who had stolen his family's money, the money that his mother had put aside to buy exit visas and passports to get her and her other son out of Riga. And this con man had stolen all of the money and uh, Shapow's mother and brother uh, perished in, 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 in Riga as a result of this man's actions. Well, when uh, Shapow ran into this man in Jerusalem, uh, he, he beat him nearly to death, but, but, but didn't kill him. Uh, by, by 1948, uh, or just prior to 1948, uh, Shapow joined the Ergon, uh, which was uh, an Israeli military unit uh, to fight for Israeli independence. And then in 1948, he joined the IDF and fought for uh, uh, Israeli independence in their uh, war of independence. Um, he uh, survived, uh, was not wounded, and he met a young woman there who became his wife. And after the establishment of the state of Israel, he and his uh, new wife uh, moved to Chicago. And from Chicago, they moved to Los Angeles where they had uh, two children, Mike and Adina. And he opened a uh, trucking company that, that became very, very successful. Um, his son said that, um, uh, Shapow was so in love with life and, and, and so excited to, to, to have uh, survived and, 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 and to, um, to, 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 to have made it out alive. Uh, and, and, and even though he had these terrible experiences, he, he had a love of life that he said just was astounding. And, and, and he wrote me this description of, of his father, which I'd like to read to you. He wrote, um, World War II experiences were life altering horrid events full of suffering and, and constantly looking death in the eye. Losing his family and friends in the Riga ghetto affected him terribly and changed his whole life. Often having terrible nightmares and crying out in his sleep, it was definitely PTSD. He was able to manage it so very well by having a zest for life and family. Boxing gave him an edge for survival in the camps and allowed him to steal food. The SS would look the other way because he was a great athlete and a great boxer. He became so popular in the camps that he was known as Nathan the Starker, which means Nate the Strong One. He always shared his loot with his mates, which made it somewhat easier for them to survive. When dad walked into a room, he had presence and when he spoke, everyone would listen with admiration and respect. He was my hero a humble, gentle giant. Adversity never scared him, for he always overcame it. He was our family's security and an example to humanity. After all he went through, not allowing it to affect him day to day, not to affect his day to day management of life. How he did it is beyond me. Uh, the the uh, next uh, person that I profiled uh, was uh, the uh, Greek middleweight uh, uh, champion. He had become the uh, middleweight champion of uh, Greece when he was uh, just turning 17 years old. His name was Salomo Arup, and he was from Salonika. Salonika had the largest Jewish population of any city in uh, Greece. Uh, it, uh, it was 35% Jewish, and most of the Jews worked uh, in the port. Uh, they had worked there for generations as stevedores, loading and unloading ships. And uh, because uh, it it was, there was such a large Jewish population that the entire town shut down on Saturday uh, for the Jewish Sabbath, which was very, very unusual. 
when the uh, when Mussolini's army invaded Greece, the Greek patriots uh, fought them, and and the Italians had to withdraw from Greece. This so upset Hitler that uh, Hitler sent the Wehrmacht to uh, Greece, and the Wehrmacht overcame all Greek uh, resistance. And one of the people that he sent to uh, to uh, Salonika to round up the Jews and have them sent to concentration camps was a man named Alois Brunner, who was a, a monster. He was tried as a war criminal after the war and he managed to escape. He escaped to Syria where he helped to train the Syrian army about how to torture Israeli soldiers after they had been captured. Uh, he died there. He was a member of the Ba'ath Party and a friend of Assad. He was a horrible, horrible human being. On March 15th, 1943, Aruk, his father, his mother, his sisters and brother all arrived at Auschwitz. Except for Salomo, they were all killed. His, his brother was killed because his brother refused to remove the gold fillings from a, a Jewish gas victims. He, he thought this was a horrible thing to do and he refused to do it. So the Nazis shot him. But once again, uh, Salomo, like these others that I mentioned, found a means of staying alive. And that means was to become a boxer. His first fight was against an enormous Czech uh, boxer and, and he soundly beat him. And as a result of that, uh, he was given a little extra nourishment, uh, maybe a little extra potato soup and a, and a slice of bread just so he could maintain his strength. But he was still uh, uh, terribly emaciated and, 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 and sickly uh, from what he was exposed to. Uh, they then brought in a, uh, uh, another uh, a major German fighter who everyone expected would, uh, would beat Salomo. It was a German fighter named Klaus Silber. And he had won, uh, prior to uh, fighting Aruk, he had won uh, 100 fights before that. And uh, Aruk realized that, that his life was on the line. If he didn't beat uh, uh, Klaus Silber, he would be killed. And he fought with every ounce of strength that he had. And he managed to, to beat Silber and beat him very badly. Because of that, uh, the SS guards dragged Silber off after the fight and he was never heard of again. Next, Salomo was to fight his boyhood friend, a man named Jacko Rosen, a Razen rather, who had won 120 fights and had also trained with uh, Salomo at a Maccabee uh, boxing gym in Salonika. But just as they were about to fight, the allies came and th they were freed uh, from the camp. After Salomo uh, won his freedom, he went to Palestine. He too uh, joined the Israeli Defense Forces and he fought for Israel, not only in 1948, but in the Six Day War in 1967. He had a successful life in Israel. He married, he had a family, and he died of a stroke there in 2009. Now, the next uh, uh, boxer I want to talk about was not a Jewish boxer. He was a Sinte, which is a category of gypsy. Gypsy is really a colloquial word. Uh, many people find it derogatory. It refers to uh, men and women who are either Sinti or Roma. And uh, this fellow, his name was Johann Trollman. And he was Sinti. And his father, because he was very swathy and he had long black curly hair, he was not the image of a typical Aryan. And though he went to a German public school, he was picked on all the time because he looked different uh, than his classmates. And uh, so his father uh, sent him to a boxing gym so he could learn to box and, and, and defend himself. Well, he turned out to be a fabulous boxer. And he was trained by a man named Eric Seeley, who was a uh, German boxing champion. He would, uh, Eric Seeley was Jewish and driven out of Germany and his title was taken away from him simply because he was Jewish. But he trained Trollman to be one of the best boxers in Germany in the 1930s. And he had a style of boxing that was reminiscent of, uh, let's say Muhammad Ali, who could dance around the ring and float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. And this was not the German way of fighting. The German way of fighting typically was to stand flat-footed in the center of the ring 
and trade punches with an opponent. Well, because he danced around and, 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 and was so fast on his feet, he was also known as the ballet dancer. Uh, his German opponents were not able to land a punch on him. And he won the light heavyweight uh, fight, uh, title against a Nazi boxer named Adolf Witt. And the, uh, the Nazis were appalled th th that he won the light heavyweight championship. So the next day they, they rescinded uh, the title. They took it away from him. Well, this caused an uproar amongst boxing fans. So the day after that, the Nazi Boxing Commission reinstalled his, his title. But they said that you have to go fight Adolf Witt again. And this time you have to fight him flat-footed the way we fight. And if you win, you're going to be taken off to a concentration camp. So you just better lose the fight. Uh, Johann Trollmann had a, an unusual sense of humor. He decided to dye his hair blonde and he covered his body with baking soda so that he was completely covered in white powder. And this was supposed to be a parody of, of an Aryan Superman. And when he entered the ring uh, looking this way, even the Nazis in the audience uh, laughed. But unfortunately, his fight was not a laughing matter and he had to lose the fight and uh, his title again was taken away from him and Witt was declared the light heavyweight champion. Uh, but uh, that wasn't uh, good enough for the Nazis. They then uh, drafted him into the Wehrmacht and they sent him to fight on the uh, Eastern Front where he was wounded and, and uh, his wounds were so bad that he was sent home. But uh, rather than receive a medal for outstanding bravery and for having been wounded, uh, he was dishonorably discharged. And then that became the policy for all Roma and Sintai who had been uh, drafted into the Wehrmacht. They were all dishonorably discharged. And uh, because of that, uh, he was no use to the Nazis anymore. So he was sent to, uh, uh, to Auschwitz. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, he, he was sent to the Nunengam uh, uh, concentration camp where he was forced to, uh, to box. And um, they didn't know that, that initially that he was a boxer and, uh, and, and they told him uh, that he just had to suffer the blows of other boxers, which he did. And, and, and he was very badly beaten and, and very badly treated there, especially by the guards. And he had a lot of friends in the camp and they felt terrible uh, that he was being so mistreated. So when another inmate died, they gave that other inmate Johann Trollmann's name, and they gave Johann Trollmann the name of the uh, inmate who died. And then they arranged for Trollmann to be sent to a, a, another uh, uh, concentration camp. Uh, the so-called Johann Trollmann corpse was cremated and his family was sent the bill for, for the corpse for the cremation. Uh, they arranged for uh, uh, Trollman to be sent to the, the Wittenberg camp. And there he was recognized finally as a boxer and forced to fight. And he had one fight after another and he won those fights. Uh, uh, because he was winning those fights, they wanted to see him lose because it was embarrassing to them that he should win, win so many fights. So they put him up against a hated capo named Emil Cornelius. And once again, uh, Trollman uh, uh, beat this person and, and Cornelius was humiliated by this. And so he gave uh, Trollman exceptionally hard backbreaking work to do. And after three days of this work, Cornelius snuck up behind uh, Trollman with a club and clubbed him on the head and beat him to death. And that was the end of uh, poor Trollman's life. Yeah, the last uh, 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 a boxer who I profiled is the one who got me interested in this subject in the first place, a man named Harry Haft, who was a, a young man in Poland. And he uh, was very young uh, when he was finally arrested. Uh, he, he was only 17 years old. And uh, before he was arrested by the Nazis, a, a Nazi SS man had come across him on a street and uh, demanded that he stand at attention uh, grabbed one of his hands, put it in a door jam, and slammed the door on his fingers and, and broke all the fingers in, in, in one hand. 
he was sent to a uh, concentration camp and he was also forced to fight. He had 76 fights and he won all 76 of them. But one of his horrible jobs in the camp was taking bodies that had been gassed and killed in the gas chambers and putting them into the ovens where they were to be incinerated. And while he was doing this, one of the men whose bodies he had uh, uh, dragged off, I guess it was a wheelbarrow, and was about to push into an oven, he saw that the man's eyes were open. The man was still alive. And he obviously did not want to put this man in an oven. It would be pure torture. And a guard was standing there. And he said, if you don't put him in the oven, I'm going to shoot you. So he put the guy in the oven, slammed the door, and heard terrible screams coming from that oven. And just a few minutes later, uh, half uh, inserted the man's wife, who was dead, uh, in, 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 into the same oven. Um, while Haft was forced to, uh, to box, the, the guards at this camp had a strange sense of entertainment. Uh, they assembled a number of uh, Jewish musicians, primarily violinists, and had them play the violin while Harry Haft was boxing people. And in one night, they forced him to have six boxing matches, which is extraordinary. I mean, a professional boxer may have uh, one bo boxing match in a month, and be exhausted from it and, and, and take weeks to recover. Here was a man who had to have six bouts in one night and he had to win every single one of them if he was going to survive. And he did. And he and another man were able to one night find and get a hold of some uh, SS uniforms and they disguised themselves as SS guards and they escaped from the camp. Uh, they were soon followed uh, by a number of uh, soldiers who were shooting at them. They quickly dived into a ditch. Harry Haft went in first. His uh, friend uh, went in second, landed on top of him. They were trailed to the ditch by two SS guards, and one of them was about to fire his uh, gun into the ditch. And the other one said to him, don't waste your bullets. They're already dead. Forget about it. Uh, and that's what saved Harry Haft's life. Uh, the next night, he was able to um, escape from the ditch, and, and he made his way uh, out of there, and uh, along the way, he came to a, a river where he found a, uh, came across a, an SS guard who was bathing himself in the river, and the guard saw him on the banks of the river, you know, still... Uh, and, and, and thought that, you know, th this was not a real SS guard, even though he had part of an SS uniform on him. And, and the uh, guard in the river came running out of the river, tried to, uh, to grab Haft, and Haft grabbed the guard's gun and shot and killed him. And then he took the butt of the rifle that he used to kill him and, and, and beat him to death uh, and, 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 and then quickly left uh, th the river. Uh, he, he dressed in that man's uniform and uh, made his way to uh, an allied camp where once again, like Shapow, he had to convince his new captors that he really had been a victim of the Nazis and was not an SS card. He had some uh, fights in a uh, displaced persons camp. And uh, from there, he sailed to New York and lived with his family in Brooklyn. And he had, had no skills. He had uh, learned to box as a teenager. That was the only thing he knew how to do. He, he had been in a camp since he was uh, well, uh, just 16. And so he hired a boxing manager, a rather naive man who tried to uh, develop a career for Harry Haft as, as a boxer. Harry Haft had some uh, preliminary uh, uh, amateur fights and then started having uh, fights as, as, a, as, as, as a professional. On July 18th, 1949, his manager arranged for him to have a fight against the man who would become the future heavyweight boxing champion of the world, a man named Rocky Marciano. And, but just before the fight, three mobsters came into Harry Haft's dressing room and they told him that if he didn't lose the fight, they would kill him. And he knew that what they were saying was true because just a few weeks before they had killed another man 
who had refused to take a dive in one of the fights that they controlled. And Harry Haft took the dive and he lost. And what was so sad about this, here's a man who had 76 fights in a, in a Nazi concentration camp, won all of them to save his life, comes to America, tries to have a career as a boxer, and the mafia ends his career. And, and, and he wound up opening a, a, a fruit and vegetable store in Brooklyn. He became a very angry man as a result of this. I mean, the traumas he had faced, not only of having to put a live person into an oven, but also having to fight for his life uh, daily, nightly, uh, what, what was unbelievable. And he was not uh, a nice person, not to his sons, not, not to his wife. And, and he, he was very, very difficult to deal with. And his sons didn't understand uh, what, what had traumatized Harry. And I, and I interviewed Harry's son, Alan Haft, who sent me this letter that he finally wrote to his father after he realized why his father was as angry and as mean-spirited as he was. And I'd like to read you the letter. <clears throat> Dear Popsy, you have been gone nearly 12 years and I miss not having a father. Growing up, you beat me for my childish misbehavior. The rage you had inside you, you often took out on me. I feared your very presence. You broke furniture and punched out windows, abused mom to no end. Despite the abuse, mom always protected you, excused your behavior because of your background. I could not excuse you until I learned what that background was. I was ashamed of you. You could not read or write. You spoke broken English with a thick accent and had those green numbers on your arm. I wish I knew then what I know now. You suffered terribly at the hands of the Nazis. You saw horror and were forced to participate in it. After you told me all about your ordeal, what you had to do just to live another day, it helped me understand why you were who you were and who you are. I now see how sorry you were for the abuse. How can anyone judge you? They call you a Holocaust survivor. But does anyone really survive? That has been said, it, it has been said that the Nazis murdered your soul. Popsy, I've spent my later years trying to make the world better for you. Your story was published by Syracuse University. You were inducted into the Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. There is a major motion picture about your life. I know that you would have been happy that I made you famous. Despite the physical and psychological abuse, I would want you to know I forgive you. Mom died this summer. She was the angel that sent by God to care for you. Now it is your turn to take care of her. Love, Alan. I, 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 I found that a very touching letter and uh, it was extraordinary uh, what these men had to endure, what they had to go through. Uh, the rest of my book uh, uh, leads, uh, is about uh, the Avengers, uh, which was a, a group of uh, men led by a, a, a very charismatic individual named Abba Kovner, who organized 250 uh, Jews who, uh, during the last couple of years of the war and up until 1950, managed to hunt out and kill 1,500 Nazi war criminals. They often disguised themselves as uh, British soldiers and uh, would go to the homes of uh, Nazi war criminals and say, uh, we need you at the headquarters for British intelligence to answer some questions. They would then drive them into the woods, force them out of the car, have them kneel down and say, it's time for justice to be done for you. And they would shoot them in the head and kill them. This group uh, uh, disbanded around 1950 and they were followed uh, by about 250 secret Mossad agents who also went around uh, and assassinated Nazi war criminals Perhaps the, the most notorious one was a man named Herbert Herbert's Kukers, who was known as, as the, the beast of Ruga and the hangman of, of, of Ruga for all the thousands and thousands of people he killed. And he was hunted down in, uh, by the Mossad and killed in uh, South America. Uh, the book concludes with the various Nuremberg trials, not just the ones where the most famous Nazi war criminals were tried, but also uh, lesser known ones, particularly the guards who oversaw the terrors that took place at the concentration camps. Anyway, that's the story of my book. 
I hope that you find it interesting and I hope that you choose to read it. If you have any questions, I would be very happy to answer any questions that you have. Thanks so much for sharing uh, some of those details from your book. That's uh, it really, I think it gives our viewers a good sense of the context or the, the material that you describe in the book. Thanks so much for doing that, Jeffrey. Uh, My I pleasure. do have a couple of questions and, and out there, I know that some of you are gonna type in questions. I just wanna encourage it. But can you tell me a little about um, what got you started here and what you want your reader to take away? Why, why focus on these boxers and what's the kind of message to take from these stories of these five boxers? Th 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 that wherever uh, bigotry, particularly anti-Semitism, uh, rears its ugly head and, and, and threatens people, people who don't do anything uh, are, are going to be complicit in, what, in, in the results of that bigotry. And, 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 and we saw this, as you mentioned earlier, when so many Germans did nothing during Kristallnacht. They just sat back and let it happen. And when you let it happen, it, it, it infects the entire society and, and, and everyone becomes guilty and complicit. But if people stand up and they stand up early enough to prevent it from happening, they can prevent terrible, terrible crimes from occurring. And, 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 and the people that I wrote about to me, they're all heroes. They, 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 they took a stand. They, they fought against something that, that largely they had no control of. But as uh, Abba Kovner uh, said, he said, we're not going to be like sheep going to the slaughter. If, if we have to die, we're going to die fighting. And there's something particularly disturbing about some of the stories that you tell, because the survival of the of some of these boxers was at the expense of somebody else that it was kind of kill or be killed and they realized it and did what they could to survive but it comes with that with that other side which is so disturbing which is that somebody else was killed did you think and and, and, and these men felt terrible guilt about it and the, 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 you know to know that i have to fight in order to survive. If I don't fight, I'm gonna be killed. But the, by the same token, I'm gonna wind up beating someone who is then gonna be killed. How do I live with that? How do I justify that to myself? It, 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 it becomes a horrible position that the Nazis put Jews in. Uh, um, you, you know, it, it was like gladiatorial combat in ancient Rome uh, where the loser was killed. And, and, and if the loser was, a friend, a neighbor, co-religionist, it, it, it didn't matter to the Nazis. It was for their sadistic entertainment. And, 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 and for that alone, they should be found guilty of, of a terrible war crime. The crime of forcing people to kill friends and neighbors in order for them to stay alive. What a, what a horrible thing to do to people. I agree. It highlights, I think, the choiceless choices. Some people refer to it as, as what uh, the Nazis forced the Jews into, where to stay alive, it was at the expense of somebody else. Exactly. Um, can you talk to us a little about your research? You obviously, and you, you, you cited it here when you were talking, but it's also, it comes across clearly in your book. You, you talked to the children of some of these boxers. Um, you're, you got involved in trying to dig up information. So tell us a little about how you came up with the information that you re record in your book. Well, I, I had the help of a very uh, excellent uh, re reference librarian who, who I always mention in my acknowledgments. His, his name is Steve Spataro, and, and he has an ability for digging things out of the internet for me that I find difficult to find. And, 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 I, and there were a lot of things, for instance, about um, uh, Victor Perez that were in French that were published in Paris in the 1930s. And, and, and I had to get that translated into English so, so that I could find it. And then I also, uh, it, it, there were uh, some uh, documentaries made about him in different languages, and I had to get those translated so, so, so that I could um, uh, learn more about him. And, and, and there were newspapers and articles uh, in Israel, in, 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 in newspapers there that I was able to find and um, the, the articles in, in, in this country. So, so, you know, for example, when, when Harry Haft 
uh, uh, landed in, in Brooklyn and became a price fighter. There were a number of articles in, in some old non-existent newspapers like the Brooklyn Eagle and, 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 and some others that I was able to find online and, 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 and read about them. And, and, and that information wasn't available anyplace else. But of course, as you mentioned, I had the, uh, the, the privilege of, of speaking to uh, Nathan Schaphau's son and to Harry Haft's son. And both of them provided me with a wealth of information and, and, and tremendous insights that I probably would not have gotten if I hadn't spoken to them. Tell me a little about boxing overall. Like, what, um, Was it much more popular in the 1930s than it is today? Is it what's going on in, in the boxing world in Germany today? Or, and how does that compare to America? Well, what's the boxing story? Well, in Germany in the 1930s, the two most popular sports were soccer and boxing. In America in the 1930s, the two most pop popular sports were baseball and boxing. And uh, when I was a kid growing up, my, my father grew up in a poor neighborhood uh, in uh, the late 1920s, and early 1930s. And it was a neighborhood of a lot of German immigrants. And he faced a lot of anti-Semitism. And as a result of that, my father learned to box and became an amateur boxer. And he had a good friend named Abe Simon, who became a heavyweight boxer. And as a matter of fact, fought uh, Joe Lewis twice for the heavyweight boxing championship in 1940 and 41, I believe it was. He lost both times. And I, I met him uh, a, a couple of times in his old age. I mean, he was suffering from terrible, arth almost crippling arthritis at the time. He was an enormous man. He was six foot five and weighed 240 pounds. And my father had told me this story, uh, two stories that I found interesting that got me further interested in boxing. Uh, uh, my father belonged to a, uh, a, uh, a, a Jewish social club and, and, and they used to have dances on Saturday night. And uh, once during um, uh, the, the night before Easter, uh, a group of Irish kids were outside this Jewish social club shouting anti-Semitic phrases. And, 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 and some of them had bats and, um, and, uh, and clubs uh, and, and they were demanding that the Jews come out and fight them. Well, none of the Jews wanted to come out and fight them, except Abe Simon and his twin brother, who were giants, went out there and there were eight kids out there. And, and they picked up, each of them picked up the side of a bench and they ran against these eight kids and they knocked them over. And the eight kids then ran away. And, and, and I found that very amusing. But then um, uh, my father also told me that in 1933, uh, he, he was a boxing fan. And he went to see uh, Max Baer, who was only partially Jewish, fight Max Schmeling, who was Hitler's favorite boxer at Yankee Stadium in, in New York. And there were about 60,000 fans in the stand. And they had heard that Max Baer was Jewish. They didn't know that he wasn't entirely Jewish, but he took off his uh, boxing robe and on one uh, part of his, his boxing trunks, was the Star of David. And all these Jews in the audience stood up and cheered. And, and I, at part of the stadium were, were members of the uh, German-American Bund, and they were waving Nazi flags. And uh, even though a, a bear uh, really didn't identify as a Jew, he did identify as a Jew when it came to the Nazis. Uh, he, his manager, who was Jewish, a man named Ansel Hoffman told him what Hitler wanted to do to the Jews. And this so incensed Max Baer that he went out and almost killed uh, Max Schmeling. He beat him up so badly th that the referee had to stop the fight in the 10th round. And when that happened, the same Jews who stood up and cheered for the Star of David stood up again and, 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 and cheered the win of this boxing match. Well, you know, a lot of people know the famous boxing match between Max Schmeling and Joe Lewis, the two ones that took place in 1939, but very few people knew about this. And, and, and I, I found this fascinating, which is why I did the research on my first boxing book, uh, uh, Max Baer and Barney Ross, Jewish Heroes of Boxing. And you know, in terms of my own in, in, in involvement, when, when I was growing up, I was a skinny little kid and my father was worried that bigger kids would pick on me. And since he knew how to box, he one day, uh, came home and brought me a pair of boxing gloves and a, a punching bag and, and a jump rope. 
and he set up some equipment for me in the basement of our house and taught me to box. And then he had a friend because he knew people in the boxing world, a man named Lou Stillman, who had a famous boxing gym on 8th Avenue called Stillman's Gym. And he went to him and asked if he could arrange for me to get 10 boxing lessons. And I got 10 boxing lessons from an Italian middleweight. And I'm sorry, I don't remember his name. And my father, it only cost $100 for these uh, uh, 10 boxing lessons. And I remember after the 10th lesson, I said to the man who was giving me the lessons, I said, you know, I'd love to get into the ring and box now. And he said, what are you crazy? You're going to get into the ring. You're going to get killed. You're going to get your head crushed. So th that was the end of my boxing experience. But I became a boxing fan as, as, as a result of those experiences. Um, I want to get to a couple of questions I see that have come in. So somebody asked if you know the name of the motion picture about Harry Haft. Do you know what the name it, of that is? It, it, it's called Survivor. And it's going to be on HBO in a couple of months. And it, and it was made by uh, Barry Levinson. Okay. So it's a new film that's just coming out? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, somebody else asked about uh, how you connect the dots to go from talking about these boxers to talking about the Avengers and the Mossad and wondering about what the connection is there for you uh, for those both during and then the post-war experience. Well, to, to my mind, they, they were all fighters. They were all people who refused to, to lie down and, and accept the Nazi dictum that you're a Jew, therefore you're a subhuman, and therefore we can do to you whatever we want. And, 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 and these were all people who said, no, I'm, I'm not a subhuman. I'm not gonna lie down and, and you can do to me whatever you want. Uh, there, there was a, a, a Jewish historian at um, uh, Yad Vashem, named Dora Pirot, I think her name is, who, who, who said uh, uh, the meaning of Zionism is, is that we, we're, we control our own destiny. We're not gonna let people push us around. And, 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 and we're going to have as many freedoms and as rights as any other human being. And, 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 and that's what these people fought for. Jeffrey, I wanna thank you. We've run out of time. I want to thank you so much for sharing this story or these stories with us and for talking about your book with us, particularly on this night we went, when we wanted to emphasize so much the story of resistance and fighting back. And to have these stories come from you just helps make that all the more apparent. So thanks so much. It was my thank pleasure. You, thank you for inviting for joining me. Us. I hope to see you at other programs soon. Have a, have a nice evening. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.